Thanks very much. Um, one thing that uh, you didn't say is actually I am the first person in history stupid enough to have walked to both bloody poles, right? <laughs> but if you are that person, I guarantee you that Rob Swan standing here is only sure of four things forever. First and foremost, I'm sure I hate bloody walking. I've done enough. Secondly, and I know you're American, so I need to translate the temperature. But the coldest day I've ever been in physically is minus 78 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and that's quite chilly. <laughs> and at that temperature, sweat turns to ice inside your clothing. So the second thing I'm sure of is I do not enjoy having ice in my underpants. It's yet to thrill. Thirdly, after 58 fairly tough years so far on the planet, no insurance company has yet to have the courage to give me life cover. You'll understand why. And lastly, which I think is hugely important for young people, is that most people say to me, before we undertake any mission, they say, Rob, you're going to fail. Rob, you're going to die. And I've never met anybody yet inspired by negative. So I think it's really important that we are positive for young people today. Now, I am not an explorer. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not a scientist. But actually, you know what I am? I'm a survivor and not bad at it. And the photograph that you see here, we're seeing a lot of this the great ice caps of the Antarctic and the Arctic are melting. Perhaps we see them too often. Perhaps we're desensitized to these things. But trust me, we should listen to this. Because I face these issues face on, walking across a frozen ocean of ice that actually is melting beneath your feet. To date, is one of the most frightening things I've ever experienced. We need to listen. And walking across those oceans is something I will never, ever forget in my life. Today, very quickly, I'd like to focus on Antarctica, the only place in the world that we, all of us, own. A beautiful, magnificent place. And it is my dream, and I hope our dream, that we should have the sense to leave one place alone on Earth that we all own as a natural reserve land for science and peace. Antarctica is such a hopeful place. It's governed and looked after by the Antarctic Treaty, signed in 1959. In 1991, an agreement was entered into which prevents any exploitation in Antarctica until the year 2041. That's when a process will start, which could mean that we either abandon this agreement, alter this agreement, change this agreement. As I stand here, in the Arctic, people are already exploiting areas that for tens of thousands of years have been covered in ice. They're already exploiting those areas. And I have spent 23 years of my life, we have 27 years to go, making sure that what is happening in the Arctic never happens in the Antarctic. We have one chance. Where did this all begin? Just like you, sir, check out that haircut. At the age of 11, <laughs> at the age of 11, I saw a film about the Antarctic. And after years of having this dream, after years of people saying to me, you will never do it, I held on to that dream. My family talked in terms of counseling and psychiatric help. <laughs> they still do, but they did more then. And after all those years driving a taxi on the streets of London, in order to have time to raise that money, we head south to the Antarctic. Five of us will live on the edge of this continent, 
for one year of our lives. We have no connectivity, no Apple iPhone 6, no radio, no postal service, nothing, and our ship leaves us now alone for one year of our lives. We go inside our tiny little home, five very different people who hated each other even in London. <laughs> but diversity has been mentioned today. Have the courage when you choose a team to choose people who challenge you, people who are different than you. That is strong. Nine months inside this box, alone, 3,000 miles from civilization, we came through that time by also remembering humor. 150 miles from our base is a small American scientific station. The American scientists believed the nearest human beings were in New Zealand, 3,000 miles away. So it was a bit of a shock after four months of darkness when five cyclists <laughs> appeared from the ocean. They thought it might be aliens, but when they saw us, there could be only one answer. British. <laughs> no one else could be quite that odd, and I absolutely loved Alex's presentation this morning. But eventually, we lay out our equipment. Integrity is not a word that we can put on our business cards. We have to win the right to believe we have it. Therefore, we carried no radio communications, no fancy satellite equipment where you press a, a couple of buttons and it tells you where you are on, are on Earth. We would attempt the longest unassisted march ever made anywhere on Earth in history, 900 miles to one building, the South Pole Scientific Station, about the size of this room. Off we go. Three people, on each sledge, 360 pounds, no backup. We must cross 6,000 crevasses. We have to learn to truly trust each other's judgment. I love showing this picture in your great country, which actually I now live in America, so there is no escape. We are now standing in an area the size of the United States of America. And we are the only people there. Think of that. It's a bit lonely. <laughs> Beneath our feet, 16,000 feet of ice. 90% of the world's ice. 70% of, of all that world's fresh water. 70%. We saw a map earlier of how small we have. 70% of that is in the Antarctic ice cap. Listen to these words. Please, carefully. If we continue to melt this ice, we swim here. If we continue to melt the ice, we swim here. As we close in after 70 days, there it was. We'd done it. It was hard work. I lost 69 pounds in body weight in 70 days. I hadn't done it. We'd done it. We stood there and for five minutes went, yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is pointless to walk to both poles. <laughs> I did it. I know. But you know something? The point was we were proud. We were proud of what we'd done and that was good enough for us. The base commander came out from the South Pole. He looked a bit gloomy, and the first words we heard in a year are, sorry, lads, your ship just sank. <laughs> first words in a year. A few problems. First, you can't insure a ship this far south on the planet. I'd promised my bank manager I would pay my debts off by selling the ship, so I lose my house, home, everybody's laughing at me. Next problem. I had promised my patron, my great true friend, Jacques Cousteau from France, a marvellous guy, did not like Englishmen. 
I don't blame him, but he liked English girls. So I found a way to go and have a chat with him. No more details forthcoming, but we became great <laughs> friends. And as my patron, he had helped me raise the money. In return, he asked me to take away our 60 tons of equipment from Antarctica. I have no ship. I have no money. I have 60 tons of equipment on the edge of the Antarctic, and I'm standing at the South Pole not having the best day of my life. However, <laughs> leadership, in my humble opinion, is about doing what you say you're going to do. Thinking carefully, making a commitment, and doing it. It took one year extra of our lives in Antarctica. But eventually, after one year of waiting, we got another ship to come south, picked up our equipment. We'd be two years in the continent in total job done. But something happened to me that brought me here. I went to the South Pole because it went down well with girls at parties. No big picture, no big reason. But walking to the South Pole, it changed me. My eyes changed color through damage in 70 days. Our skin blistered out. We wondered why, and on return, we were told by NASA that the hole in the ozone layer had been discovered above the South Pole while we were walking underneath it. <laughs> Fabulous! Ultraviolet rays down, hit the ice, bounced back, eyes burnt out, face fried off. It started me thinking that perhaps some of these issues are not somebody else's problem. First, we're not too sure why, but I'd made a promise to walk to both poles, so now we head north. The North Pole is a frozen ocean. You will march 700 miles away from the safety of land every step. It's a desperate struggle. You can also be eaten <laughs> as you go to add to the fun of North Pole travel very quickly. <laughs> My view on climate change and global warming very quickly. Climate change is happening. It is definite. It looks fairly likely and the United Nations and scientists keep telling us that we are causing this problem to perhaps happen faster and perhaps happen more, but some of us still don't seem to believe it. Very simply, it's this. What does a survivor do to stay alive? If you see a problem, you deal with it before it hits you. That's how you stay alive. So climate change is something we need to deal with and make it a good business opportunity. Otherwise, it will not last. And if we still don't believe it, let's have the next world summit on this iceberg with a polar bear. <laughs> because in 25 years since I walked to the pole, we walked to the pole. The polar bear has gone from untouched to endangered. Why? Because the, their home is melting. If you want to know how it feels, next time you dive into a swimming pool, come up for air and imagine that the sides of the swimming pool have disappeared. It's happening. We need to listen to it. 25 years ago, we had plenty of ice. Here's me coming in from washing at minus 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Naked. Gentlemen. You will notice, gentlemen, and I'm going to use it. <laughs> That's the wrong one. Yeah, I've got it. You will notice, gentlemen, that there is absolutely nothing hanging down in the central area of the photograph. <laughs> it is your job, gentlemen, to explain to our esteemed ladies later why this happens to a naked man at minus 70. It's cold. We are now 647 miles from land. 647 miles from land. And the only thing we hadn't planned for happened. The entire Arctic Ocean melted 
four months before it ever had, and we're dead. Do remember we are British-led. So we don't have a CNN camera crew filming us. <laughs> there is no Russian submarine on standby, just in case we get our feet wet. No one knows where we are. And in order to stay alive, we cheat time. We can have 40-hour days now. Why? Because it's always daylight at the pole. And I think we've seen some grim enough things today for me to show you this picture without feeling too bad. But uh, our brave American Daryl Hutt from Harlem, New York City, who would become the first American in history to reach the pole, his heel dropped off 210 clicks out. He kept walking. And after 56 fairly desperate days, we stood there. We'd done it, not me. We'd done it. And we flew a wee flag, the flag of the United Nations. To be honest with you, after getting to both poles, I was depressed. All my life seemed to fall to bits. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. To achieve everything you thought you wanted to achieve, you do it. And then it's all empty. And I had a tough time. But hope came in the form of Jacques Cousteau, who summoned me and said, Rob, what are you doing for the next 50 years, boy? And I said, tell me. And he did. And he gave me the mission of 2041. First, we'd have to buy a yacht to visit Antarctica. And Peter, founder of Pink, he helped me so much. Pete, up there. Thanks, mate. Good on you. And we would sail to all three world summits to, ve to visit the world leaders. And uh, you'll like this one. For the second world summit in Johannesburg, 2002, we made the longest overland voyage ever made in history with a yacht. <laughs> 8,000 miles round southern Africa to see kids who'd never seen the sea. They'd never seen a boat. They'd never seen a red Englishman. They'd never seen an iPod. They came out to see us. It was fabulous. And every year, I take business women, business men, young people, students, teachers to Antarctica. Uh, every year from many nations. You're probably thinking, this Englishman doesn't look particularly English colored. Why? I've lived in India for the last four years. Why? Because they have a population of 1.4 billion. 1.4 billion people. And you're about to meet my mum, but when my mum was born, the population of the planet was only 1.8 billion people when she was born in 1914. Same goes for China. Whatever we do here, we have to realize the numbers and work with India and China on these issues. Also, and I'm so proud of this, we have involved women from the Middle East. If you think it's hard to walk to both poles in your underpants backwards, it's easy compared to get, getting a girl to come to Antarctica from Saudi Arabia, but we did it. And we've involved over 60 women from the Middle East, all from countries who've never visited Antarctica, and they've become fabulous champions. What a place to go. What a privilege it is to go to the Antarctic. It's not for Tarzans and Amazons. We've done all that nonsense. It's for people who care. It's for people who need to see that places like Antarctica are telling us something, and we should listen very, very carefully. All these people return back as champions for their own issues at home, but they also return back as champions on Antarctica. Very, very quickly, as part of the mission, I like action. So over eight years, 10 million bucks idiot here had to raise. We cleaned up 1,500 tons of garbage from the Antarctic. My mum, there she is, I love my mum, 100 years old, and she is still re recycling. <laughs> and if she can do it, We can do it. 
So we, we cleared all this rubbish from the Antarctic. And I love India. I truly love India. We've heard a lot from it. And barefoot college man, you know, Bunker, what a, what a fella. But as he knows, if you took a yacht to India, people would laugh at you. You'd end up in customs for 47 years. So unfortunately, over the last three and a half years, I've had to do 5,200 miles on a bicycle. <laughs> But you know something? It was relevant to young people. I ask you in a very humble way, in all that we do, just to make sure we're still being relevant. Because sometimes we think we are, and often we're not. But bicycling around India, I liked it because of the color of the traffic signal. It's red, there aren't any rules. There, I saw so much plastic garbage, which will end up in the ocean from rich European com companies, American companies, trying to increase their market share, but not really thinking about where all the garbage goes. But I met some fab women. Don't mess with this small lady here. She got a team of people together in India unbelievable women who go into garbage dumps bigger than this entire city. And they're starting to recycle, followed that through to the end, and we made desks for schools that didn't have desks. It's only small, but one should make an effort. I build education stations all over the world running only on renewable energy. Why? Because it's the best way to save Antarctica. If we're using more renewable energy in the real world, we won't need to go to Antarctica to exploit it. It won't make financial sense. Amazing country, India. This is my favorite photograph on the planet. Why? This is the entrance to the uh, parliament of India. I love India. Have a chat with these chaps on the right. Could you just stop the traffic for a second? Certainly. Picture taken. <laughs> and. We have built an education station only running on renewable energy in the Himalayas, which, as we've heard today, are melting. This family saw their first electric light, just like the barefoot college people, through solar lighting, not from the grid. We've built our first education station here in the United States. We have managed to fix the hole in the ozone layer. None of these things are impossible. We just need to engage on them. But six months ago, as I quickly come to the end of the story, NASA told us that the Western Antarctic ice shelf is now in disintegration. It's melting. And that in my mum's lifetime, 100 years from now, the sea level will rise by four feet minimum, which puts this town swimming. This is going to happen. So we've got to start to not use always sustainability. We have to use resiliency. And what's our response to this challenge? We've just got to do the best we can. So really, unfortunately, we're now seeing parts of Antarctica, Alex knows about this, areas the size of small countries breaking off. We have to do something, I've got to go back. In my business, you're an old man at 35. And at the end of next year, I've got to go back to the South Pole and do my best. And the best is, we will return to the South Pole itself and retrace our steps of 30 years ago. It's going to hurt. It really will hurt, but it needs to be done. And how we're going to do it is we're throwing away fossil fuels for the first time in Antarctic history and surviving only on renewable energy. It's never been done, but we're going to do it, and we're going to spread that message out to young people with a message of hope, mainly through my son, who, God bless him, has volunteered to march side by side with his father on this expedition. His name is Barney. I think, Larry, you're there, sir. I think what you said about creativity sparked my mind. 
I'm not somebody who just says things. I hope you realize that. Too many words in this world. I'm tired of them. And I'd like very much to take a student from your wonderful institution, from your college, with me to Antarctica next March. Somebody who can do some artistic work in this last great wilderness to help us. I'm also making a commitment to take one of those fabulous solar engineer ladies from the Bare Barefoot College. That's my effort. We've got to do some more walking. We've got to keep this work up. And thank you very much. Um, and finally, finally, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, really. But you know what the deal is here? What we've got to do is we've got to inspire that creativity because too many people, are, too many young people are looking down. We need to use that technology and inspire them to look up. Good luck to you all and thank you so, so much. Thank you.